I'm Geronimo from Sirius XM. Uh, we are a subscription radio service. If, for those of you that don't know, hopefully you have the service. And this is Team Hardwell. I'm going to introduce everybody to my left and to your right. Uh, is a guy by the name of Hardwell. We have a round of applause for Hardwell. Now, I've known Anna for a long time. Uh, she manages Hardwell. She does many different things. And I just found out today that the K at the beginning of her, of her name is not silent. So this is uh, Anna Knopp. And by the way, bes besides uh, managing Hardwell, uh, she also has the Anna Agency and Sorted Management, uh, also uh, an integral part of Revealed Recordings. And what don't you do? I mean, you do a lot. Uh, next to her is uh, a gentleman by the name of Paul Morris, who uh, is founder of AM Only, president and CEO as well. So glad that, uh, that Paul is here and, and part of the team as well. Uh, this guy uh, keeps everything in control, I hope. Try to. Uh, uh, Manny Zalea, who is Hardwell's tour manager. And uh, he's with him all the time. We'll find out how much uh, in a little bit. Uh, Sebastian is uh, manager, revealed recordings, uh, also an artist manager for the company. And oh, he's all the way in the end. Sorry about that, Justin. Uh, and uh, Justin uh, Lubliner is head of publicity for this team. He does several different things within the industry, but uh, he's also a major part of Team Hardwell. Can we have a round of applause for everybody up here? Uh, Justin, I have a uh, question for you. Um, oh boy. <laughs> nothing bad. Um, so how long have you been a part of this team? Uh, I think we're coming on two and a half years now. You know, I was, I was one of the first to actually join up on the Hardwell squad. Um, I think I was a senior in college at the time, so a long time now. You were um, still in your exams, yeah. Started early. What's up? You were still in your exams. As the yeah, I was, I was in my, my midterm exams at the time we met up, actually, yeah. What made you jump on board? I mean, was it just a conversation with Anna or? Um, at the time, I was juggling a few different things. I, I'd moved to LA to go to USC where I was in the music industry program. And I'd done that to kind of keep my foot in the door and you know, have opportunities where I can intern and, and you know, meet people in LA. Um, and I was managing artists. I'd run a blog at the time that I was doing pretty well. Um, and I stumbled on a job opportunity pretty early. And I actually had that job opportunity taken away from me. I might have said something bad in a meeting one time, but that kind of was like my first roadblock where I really had this kick in the face where you know, I really want to do something on my own. So I started kind of compiling ideas in my head in which I could be a leader in a newfound industry of which um, you know, I can create my own niche. And at the time, electronic music was bubbling. Um, I was managing electronic music DJs. Um, I had this blog, so I'd found out that I could start a new age fully functional PR marketing artist development company. Um, being that I was the target market and that I was appealing to people that were similar to me. Um, I was friends with bloggers, I understood the community quite well, um, and I felt that I had a couple good ideas for marketing. So I just started pitching artists. At the time, um, I was very close with a, you know, a couple agents at AM Only who were throwing me into meetings with different managers. And my first client was Nikki Romero at the time who I'd pitched for you know, four months, had multiple phone calls of which they said, you know, no, no, we're not ready yet, um, and eventually convinced their team to let me start very low at a position that they didn't think they needed. Um, and it kind of just bubbled from there. Um, I was introduced to Anna, and we'd met in LA, and we kind of got along very quickly and worked my way on a trial three-month period until I found my position as the marketing PR guy in his, in his um, camp. Well, I've heard a lot of the ideas that you pitch, and they're pretty damn good, so you do a good job. Thank you. Um, so actually, I, I saw most of this team earlier in the week. It feels like it was two months ago, but it was actually just a few days ago at the Sirius XM studios where um, Hardwell was nice enough to play a live set and we played some songs. And uh, later in the day, uh, there was a massive announcement. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you guys about it because it's, it's an announcement you don't really see very much these days 
where many different things come together at the same time, and, and it's got to be difficult, and I really want to touch upon that. Now, uh, and, and I'm going to go back to Justin real quick. Uh, so this was a, a major, major thing, and what we're talking about is the announcement of the tour and then Madison Square Garden, which, uh, that, that's a big place. I don't know if you, know, you realize how, how big it is to fill that place. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about it, and then I'll, I'll talk to the rest of the panel. Yeah, sure. Um, so Anna, in one of our weekly phone calls, mentioned to me that we were you know, starting to do the marketing and promo for this, this new I Am Hardwell run that was happening in the US, um, which would conclude his world tour. So it was obviously an exciting phone call. And the initiative that she had come up with on vacation was to do this Times Square takeover and take over nine jumbotrons um, all over the, you know, the, the ten block well, radius. The plan was all, but that's what it was. It was all the jumbotrons. I, I, I got the call from Anna to say I want to take over the entire Times Square, and I said, okay, yeah, that's. Uh, that sounds nice. Let, let's see what we can do. At, at that point, does the phone drop, and you're like, "Oh shit! What? Are, yeah, what, what do we do now?" Nine now? jumbotrons. I mean, you know, having been born and raised in New York City, it's hard to do anything. You know, let alone I mean, this government politics, local government politics, but to uh, launch a campaign with you know nine jumbotrons. Would anybody say, uh, you know, we can't do this? I, I don't know. Did it ever come up? I, I was I was a little skeptical when, <laughs> on the call, but uh, you know we made some phone calls and we ma we made it happen. So then what happens? So then we kind of just went back and forth with a, with a few ideas and how we would tease this to the public. Um, and at the time, Layla, who runs the ALDA events, all day, um, who's also helping run point on the on the I Am Hardwell tour, called me up and at like 8 a.m. in the morning, and I was just pacing around my table a hundred times, which I tend to do. Um, and we came up with this idea to do a teaser concept of which we would have uh, ten or sorry, seven different photo images um, which would eventually make up the Times Square um, imagery in kind of like a puzzle piece format. Um, day one, it would be all black and you'd get a little piece of the triangle which you can see start of the, the start of Times Square. Um, uh, it's, it's a long process, but we, we came up with a hashtag that we can tease people with, which was uh, HWTS, which I wanted people to think was like Hardwell Tiesto collaboration, get people buzzing about it. And then we also did an opt-in, um, and when you opted into the, into the, um, into the opt-in, you were to get an email when the announcement happened from Hardwell personally that gave you a pre-sale code of which you'd be able to buy tickets beforehand. So we teased this whole thing over seven days, and we were, we were talking to a lot of the blogs. I called them up and got them really involved in the process, like, hey, you know, don't tell anyone, but we're doing the secret announcement in Times Square. We'd appreciate if you'd cover it. Um, and then day of, we had them all come out, write stories about it. Robert was doing a ton of interviews with Sirius and MTV and Billboard, and we kind of just made this, this beautiful Times Square takeover, um, a worldwide story, um, which, which ended up being a really cool Thing. We got you know, tens of thousands of email addresses, a bunch of um, opt-ins, which is very nice, and, and a worldwide community buzzing about a concept that we were super excited about. Now then, who goes to, to this gentleman right here and says, this is what we have planned? What, when did you hear it? Uh, I think when Anna called me with the whole idea and we're going to take all the times, I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. And uh, uh, I think it was the same as Paul, a bit skeptical in the, in the first place when I heard it, but uh, well, we did it. You know, and um, I think it was a great way to announce the North America tour. So it's the uh, I Am Hardwell tour. Um, can we talk about what cities you'll, you'll be in? Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, the I Am Hardwell tour we, is, uh, it's been going great. You know, we did over 20 different countries. Every single show was sold out so far. And we waited really long to come to North America just to make, you know, make the bus bigger. And now we announced seven cities, San Francisco, L.A., Chicago, Miami, uh, Toronto, Vancouver, and we're closing this world tour with the Madison Square Garden, which was always a dream for me to ever do my own concert in. And well, dreams can come true. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> uh, at least I, I think it holds over 20,000 people. I mean, that's that's a lot of lot of people. It is a lot of people, definitely. Yeah. You just take a deep breath. You're like, uh oh, we're what am I getting it. myself into? But you've <laughs> played before, you know, a hundred thousand people, whether it's here in Vegas or worldwide. I mean. Anything nervous, ner nerve-wracking about uh, playing at Madison Square Garden for you? Definitely. Well, I think Madison Square Garden is the venue of the world still, you know? Um, like all the big artists in the world, even the pop artists, singers, uh, have performed there. So 
as an EDM artist, especially as a DJ, to come there and do your own concert. It's something really rare, you know? Uh, if people have, have seen the Swedish House Mafia documentary, they said exactly the same, you know? Nobody could have managed it like four, three, four years ago that like an EDM act will ever fill up Madison Square Garden, and now we're doing it. So, um, I guess about two months ago, on Sirius XM on Electric Area, we launched a daily show with Hardwell. And a lot of work goes into it, and a lot of it falls on Sebastian's shoulders. Uh, tell me about what you do. How do you prepare for that show? How, how do you pick the music when he's traveling all over the world? Uh, and also, you need to record, and you need to get him in the studio. How do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, we have, we have like, um, we, every week we have a new release on Revealed. So it's pretty easy to get this playlist done for a series exam. Uh, every week we have a new release. Uh, sometimes we have a, a Miami sampler or a festival EP. And most of the tracks on Revealed Radio will be a selection of his radio show, Hard One Air. And then we will pick the best tracks of this week and then we put them through a series exam. And every Monday or Tuesday we have a, a call with Robert and then we will say, okay, what kind of tracks do we have for this week, for Hard One Air, and what kind of tracks do we select for Revealed Radio. And that's how the playlist will be built and every, every week we have new tracks, new releases. And yeah, we try to keep, to upload, uh, to give them like new tracks on, uh, from Revealed uh, before they got released on Beatport. So I think that's a great way to addition for the show. Yeah. Well, selfishly, I like it because we get to play new music before yeah. anybody else. But uh, you ever have a, a hard time finding this guy? Is that where, where Manny comes in? <laughs> yeah, well, we have a great demo pool uh, on our website, um, people can upload their demos, and we get over 5,000 demos a week. And uh, not many people know this, but we listen to every demo. We have like a few, we have a team of people who are listening to every demo. And uh, yeah, Robert's got a lot of tracks as well from the biggest DJs. Um, and then he, he's, he's forwarding these tracks to us, to the rest of the team, from me and Matthijs. And then we say, yeah, we want to sign this or not, or we're going to discuss it like uh, every week, like on a Wednesday. And then, yeah. So it's, you get a lot of music. So it's really easy because we're the leading, uh, best, one of the best selling labels on Beatport. So everyone wants to release on Revealed. So it's really easy to get the music. So Manny, how do you, uh, how do you keep an eye on, on him? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't sleep. That's, that's, that's the key right there. Um, try to make sure that uh, he gets his rest, doesn't drink too much. That's the, that's, the, that's the hardest right there. <laughs> and especially when Tiesto's in the building. You gotta, gotta watch out for the Jaeger. And uh, just make, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hard job, but um, it's, it's worth it though. Rob Hard was a good guy and uh, he's driven, really driven. And so it, make, it pushes me to want to make sure I look after him well. Is it like, is there ever a time you're like, oh please, Hardwell, not again. Just, um, not I just need to rest. Sometimes, sometimes, but you know what though? Uh, plenty of time to sleep when you die, I always tell him. So <laughs> when, he's going, when he's going all in, he's going in for a long night, I know, he lets me know beforehand, Manny, tonight, it's on. So I already prepare myself <laughs> mentally that it's gonna be a long night of Jaeger. Jaeger shots all night. Is, and, is, is it on tonight? It's on tonight. It's on tonight. It's on tonight. <laughs> and it's on tonight. I was, I was already warned when I woke up this morning. Yeah. So in other words, we, sh we need to keep Tiesto far away from this guy. Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Remember that. Um, Paul, we were talking a little bit about uh, your relationship with Hardwell backstage, and uh, you play a major role in, in uh, the bookings, and you've been part of this team for quite some time as well. Uh, not, not too long ago, and it's not... Uh, it, it's common knowledge now, it's been widely talked about, uh, Hardwell being chosen as the number one DJ in the world, according to uh, DJMag.com, which is really an, an unbelievable accomplishment for a guy, I think you were, 20, you were still 25 when, when that yeah. came through, and you're now 26. Uh, is that something that, Paul, that you saw in the radar, you saw that straight ahead coming? I think, I think you could feel it coming, I mean, some, there was just a, 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 an underlying something, like his, his socials were, were out of control. You, look, you could look on Facebook and you see the amount of people talking about him. And um, yeah, I, I, I really actually did feel it coming. And I mean, 
I'm not sure that everybody knows this. I'm not sure if everyone's seen his documentary, but I mean, harbaugh has been DJing for you know 10 plus years now. He's not you know he's not just an overnight sensation. Um, he's just he's an incredibly talented producer, uh, fantastic day, DJ, incredibly driven. So yeah, I, I I I felt I definitely felt it. How about you? Did you feel it? Um. Well, not really. I didn't really feel it. You know, I was really surprised actually three years ago when I was the highest new entry on 24 on that list, because the year the year before I was even in the, like the first two 200, and then out of nowhere I was 24. And from that point, actually, it was uh, everything went went so 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 quick. You know, uh, I jumped to number six, and um, well, it's 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 just incredible. You know, just to be in, in to achieve that in three years. Not, not, like Paul managed, I've been DJing for over 10 years, but to come in, in to enter a list uh, three years ago, and within three years you jumped to a number one position. The only the only DJ who ever did that was Tiesto. So it's well, it, I didn't feel it. Well, for some reason we saw it coming, but there was more like on the socials, you know, when we uploaded my live set from uh, Ultra Miami, it had over like a million views in like two days. And if you compare that at that point to the other DJs, they were not just over 100,000. So the the engagement and the dedication of my fans is just incredible. Still, it's it's incredible, even on my socials. And all, I, the only the only way where we actually saw it coming was yeah on socials and by the engagement of the fans. You know, you, your fans scare me in the fact that they're so dedicated and there's there's so many of them. Uh, for Sirius XM, at the end of uh, 2013, we did a also we polled our fans and our our listeners who they're they felt was the number one DJ, and uh, without, you know, it was without a doubt, you were number one. And, but the socials were through the roof. It was just like nothing I'd seen before. And I was like, if Hardwell tells these people to kill me, I'm dead. <laughs> I mean, this, it's, they're like an army. I was, you know, uh, there's, there's power in numbers, without a doubt. Uh, so I, I guess I answered my own question about selling at Madison Square Garden, because I think you just have to send out a tweet, and that's it. Well, with a link. Uh, Harbour was at, in Times Square the, the other day for, for the announce, and uh, he was in the M&M store uh, <laughs> doing an interview, and a fan saw him in there, tweeted, and next thing you know, there are, there are 400 Harbour fans there. And, and the security in the, in the store didn't know what was going on. So we know that Harbour fans are fast, too. <laughs> <laughs> and very engaged on social media. Yeah, they really, really are. That's, that's what I noticed. Um, you know, not to knock any other DJs or, or producers, but massively uh, active, I mean, and global, which is, which is really amazing. Uh, I f almost feel like you're equally as, as popular, if not more, in the United States as you are in Europe, and you're wildly popular overseas as well. So congratulations. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're sitting underneath the EDM Biz uh, banner here, and I know um, you mentioned in an interview that sometimes you're not all that comfortable with the term EDM, because it, it sort of narrows things. Well, I think, I think the reason why I always say that is because I'm from overseas, you know, I'm from Europe and we have dance music, house music, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I'm still playing house music, dance music, you know, whatever you want to call it. And I, I, I like the term electronic dance music because it is electronic dance music. But if you, in America, if you say electronic dance music, it's a really dirty word now because everybody's thinking about uh, generic billboard big room, whatever you want to call it, sound, and like the sellout sound for, of the sellout word for DJs now, that's EDM. And actually it's just a term for a, a genre, you know, and that's dance music. And that's why I always, always call it dance music. And even I'm not like a genre guy, you know, I don't play progressive music, I don't play big room music, I don't play electro, whatever I want to play, you know, I play hardwell music, that's what I always say. And well, yeah, the term EDM, I don't know. For some, for, for some reason, I think it's just the media, you know, that made it a dirty word, and I just, I just prefer to call it dance now, music. You're, you're obviously, uh, you have your own opinion very strong, and you, you say it well. And as managing him, is, is there ever a point where you're like, oh, no? You know, because he, he does have his own strong opinion. No. I think always everything he says, he makes it, he makes it happen. That's the nice thing. I really enjoy working with him. I mean, I remember last year we did, was it last year, Governor's Island? Yeah. And then he said, yeah, next year we do Madison Square Garden. And I was like, okay, 
we have to make that happen. It's going to happen. And that's always with Robert. He says something and he sets goals for himself and for us too. And yeah, we always reach them. Onto, yeah. So, you know, as far as the touring, and you tour a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, you just played the Dominican Republic last night? Or yeah, last night. So you flew in today. Uh, you get to sort of, you know, rest for a couple of days here in Vegas, but you're still working. Uh, and then you fly out again. Uh, I mean, when do you have time to rest? And because you're also producing and uh, you're a, a label executive and uh, you wear a lot of hats, when do you rest? Um, not that much, actually. <laughs> no, well, but it's the thing is, people always ask you, you're, you're always working. But on the other hand, I'm never working. I never worked in my life because I'm still doing what I love to do. And, you know, my, my daily schedule is I wake up, I check my emails, do my emails. Uh, the first call is always, is always with Anna or with Sepp, you know, talking about revealed recordings, the demos, uh, uh, yeah, just checking all the new music, stay up to date with the blogs. Um, well, and actually the next thing is uh, entering the plane again, uh, working on my own songs, working on a remix deadline, have to play the same night and the day starts over again. So yeah, well now, now I'm in Vegas for like three days, I fly in, I'm flying straight back home on Saturday. And, well, I only have s Sunday and Monday to work on my album, and Tuesday starts my Ibiza, Ibiza residency, so that's actually how it goes. Because, yeah, at this point, I, I, I told my fans to, that they can, can expect an artist album this year. And normally I was used to release, like, four singles over the year, and now I have to make, out of nowhere, like, 12 songs or 13 songs in, in a couple of months. And I really enjoy doing this, but, uh, well, it takes a lot of time, you know, and a lot of, kind of a lot of pressure. But yeah, for rest, no, there's no time for rest. <laughs> well, just don't tell your fans to kill me. That's, that's all I'm concerned about, because they're, they're tough. Um, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that there are very few DJs that are touring successfully, that are hit the, the age of 40 and above. And uh, the, the hip-hop artist, actor, Ice Cube, once said that uh, hip-hop is a young man's game. And, you know, a lot, a lot can be said for electronic music as well. Do you see yourself keeping up the schedule in 14 or 15 years, or you, you can't even think about that now? I really enjoy doing it. And as long as I enjoy what I'm doing, I will be, will be around. Well, I hope to be around then. You know, I'm a music lover, I love to DJ, I always DJ my whole life, so I will never give up DJing, but maybe, yeah, maybe I will, I don't know, maybe in a couple of years, let's say 10, 15 years, I will decide to, you know, do only like the bigger festivals or uh, well, the more important gigs and focus me more on the label, managing all the, art, the other artists as well. Because, yeah, besides revealed recordings, I'm um, also like a small part of the management for Danik and Dairo and all the, guy, all the guys. So, you know, I, I like working with all those new artists as well. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where it's going in 10 years. So far, I really enjoy, you know, being hard while and touring <laughs> all around the world. Um, we talked a little bit before uh, backstage also about. Um the fact that my perception of this team is that it's really all about family, and that's why it's very successful. Anna has two daughters. Uh, Paul's married uh, with, with children. And uh, I've actually seen Paul's family at you know, different festivals, his wife included. Uh, do, you, do you guys believe that that's uh, key to success, uh, with, with, at least with Team Hardwell, uh, Anna? Well. It takes a lot of time, you know? I mean, we work 24-7. So your family needs to be part of that because otherwise you won't see them. They don't understand. So yeah. I mean, when Robert is in Amsterdam, he passes by the house, he knows my daughters. My husband works at my company now. And I think that makes it all a lot easier and more organic. Yeah, I actually, I felt bad because uh, Anna, I was emailing her and I didn't get a reply. And then I got a reply, and I think it was uh, Sebastian that said, "Well, you know, she's on her honeymoon," and you were actually replying to emails from your honeymoon. Uh, yes. But you know, it's great that your husband understands. Yeah, I mean, I might be on honeymoon, but if I stop emailing for like a week, that doesn't help. Everything evolves so fast and goes so fast. It's just it doesn't work if you just go off the radar for a week. Right. And I think a great thing to add is that we're actually, we're, we are a family. Yeah. You know? We're, yeah. I, I see Anna more often than my own mother. <laughs> so, you know, that's, 
and we're always, we're always in contact, you know, these are the guys and this is like the family I'm always around with since I'm always touring, you know, I don't have the time actually to, uh, well, always be in touch with my family. Of course, I, I'm talking to my mom and dad every day, but, you know, this is the team where we, we, we're, we're always working together, so we're and almost like a And it goes organic with us because yeah. we spend so much time, we're a lot on the road, we go over stuff, we never really, s we do have m proper meetings, but not like set staff meetings or because we are so spend so much time together we discuss things along the way and it works really well are there ever any like all families any family fights every family has fights, <laughs> <laughs> but Paul. not really no no this mm -hmm. no we're cool i think everybody yeah. is we're all loving what we do uh, we're honest with each other and yeah paul how do you fit in your family uh into into your busy schedule with Team Hardwell. My wife is actually general counsel, now AM only, so I see a lot of her. She's often said that I'm, I'm her worst client, because I'm, 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 I'm Could very, she fire you? She cannot fire me, I can't <laughs> fire her. Um, but I'm, I'm very non-communicative, so she likes to deal with the people around me and not necessarily directly with me. But it, yeah, it's, it's nice to have her around. As Anna said, like, if she wasn't there, I probably wouldn't see her very much, because you know, I work a lot. Um, my kids drive me to the office by Monday morning. I'm happy to get to the office. Um, but uh, no, I, I love to have them with me at uh, whatever, at festivals and events, and they, they, love, they love the music, and yeah. Manny, how do you fit this into your, your, or how do you fit personal life into Team Hardwell? Wow, um, I was thinking about that the other day. I saw my mom for the first time in like close to a year the other day. I hadn't seen my grandmother, in, a little over a year as well. So um, I've been realizing lately, torn for like seven years now, that uh, I've been losing a lot of time with my family members and my friends. Every time I see them, everyone's getting older and I'm starting to lose touch with everything. But this is, a, you know, this is the life I chose. I enjoy it. I live a very privileged life. It's very humbling and um, being a part of Team Hardwell now, just, uh, just living the dream right now, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's tough with my family, but uh, you know my girlfriend understands the job. She's in, you know, she's in nightlife. My my family, they understand that. I guess the the only person I don't really speak to is my sister. She doesn't understand it, so we don't really talk that much. Yeah, it's tough. It's it's a life that's very tough. I think everybody in this panel and and probably everybody in this room understands, you know, that the crazy touring life and touring schedule and. Uh, you know, I, I always like to ask artists, and I, and, uh, I ask um, Hardwell this on the air, but, you know, do you wake up and wonder, where am I? There was a, a commercial a couple of years ago where a guy was like, what's up, Chicago? And somebody whispers in his ear, you're in Detroit. So does that ever happen where you have no idea where you are? Yeah, definitely. Well, if you're constantly on the road, you know, we do have like sometimes like 200, 200 250 flights a year. And with several gigs on one day. So yeah, sometimes you, you wake up and you're like, okay, am I still in Miami? Or, you know, if you, it, it always happens when that day when you're like rested, you know, when you're rested and you wake up and you have a long sleep, like over 10 hours, you know, and I wake up, I'm always like, okay, where am I? I have to like set myself, well, set myself up again in another room and yeah, sometimes it happens. So Justin, I want to get back to what we were talking about with squeezing and family. So. You're sort of a bi-coastal guy. You spend a lot of time in New York and L.A. Uh, how do you squeeze in your Team Hardwell family with what you might do personally? We make him stay up till midnight because I want early morning calls. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and, and by the way, that there's a whole other dynamic where if you're on West Coast time and they're uh, in Dutch time, that's a pretty significant difference. Nine hours. Yeah, we, we manage. <laughs> um, well, my family is Team Hardwell. Um, my mom is Hardwell's biggest fan. She comes to the shows. Um, some might remember the, the time in Miami when she was in the DJ booth taking shots with us. That was pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, personal life, Hardwell life, I mean, it's all intertwined. Uh, my, fa my family supports what I do and they're happy to come out and they get really excited to come to the shows and meet the team. Um, my sister actually turned me on to Hardwell many years ago. She's a big fan as well. So I think it's, uh, it's just a balance um, and then back to the family with, uh, with us, uh, you know, I think there's just a situation that we've all discovered where they're a little bit, you know, they stay a little bit later and we kind of just communicate in the morning. I do a lot of my um, Dutch homework 
as early as possible or as late as possible and we get stuff done. It's not a big deal. And we meet many times out of the year, so we're good. Sebastian, how about you? How do you fit in Team Hardwell with your personal? Well, for me, it's really easy. Um, I don't have a wife. I don't have children. I don't, uh, you know, I see her Robert more often than my own sisters or her family. So I'm fully dedicated to Team Hardwell. And yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see any problems. I think well, music is my life, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's, for me, it's no problem. And they, they like the music, they understand it, and they are really supporting me as well, so yeah. So uh, actually, it brings up a good point where uh, you, know, you manage uh, a lot of things with revealed recordings on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Hardwell is a very important artist on that label, but there are other artists as well. You have Danik and Dairo. And uh, how do you manage that? How do you show equal love to all three artists? Well, you know, Robert is the, it's really, for Robert, he's, he's the number one, of course, in our agency, but it's really easy to um, support our other DJs together with Robert because they're touring to together. We did like a North American bus tour, and then we had Danik and Dairo as well on the bus tour. So it's like, you know, we're combining those three guys in one time. So. It's not like they have their different pets, so we can combine the, the artists, artists really easy with Revealed. So we have a lot of events as well, so we can put them on, on our Revealed events. So it's like a combination of all those yeah, factors. So it's really easy to manage, actually. How did they come on board? Who found uh, Danik and Dyra? It's me. How did, how did uh, that come about? Uh, well, yeah, we started Revealed Recordings like four years ago, and uh, I, I, one of the reasons why I created the label, because I believed in a lot of music that like, a lot of big labels didn't want to sign, and they didn't want to invest in new talents, because they, you know, they didn't want to invest the money, because they were like an, an unknown artist and whatever, you know. And that's why actually we started Revealed Recordings to release my own tracks, so I can be my own A&R, I don't have to deal with another A&R. Um, yeah, well, Danik was one of my best friends. I know Danik for like over eight years, and uh, he's a, he was a very talented producer, but he needed more, some more help, so I shared some studio time with him, helped him. Uh, besides that, he was already like an amazing DJ. He's been DJing over 12 years, you know, from small bars and weddings to like bigger clubs, and now he's playing uh, EDC this weekend, so he came a long way as well. And um, yeah, that's actually how I helped Danik, and uh, I think Danik is, uh, well, is an amazing artist nowadays, nowadays already, and he's still, he's growing really fast at this point. And uh, the, I discovered Dairo three years ago just to, to, uh, through SoundCloud. Uh, somebody pointed me at his SoundCloud page, and they were like, there were like only two songs on it, but I loved the songs. I wanted to sign those two songs, and when I contacted him, and uh, I asked him to send me like more music he was working on, like every single song he was sending me I wanted to sign, like it was <laughs> unbelievable, I never, it's hard, like in, 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 in every, every, um, how you say that, it, 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 that only happens like once in like three years that one artist just comes up with like only like really good songs, normally they make one good hit and the, the second song sounds exactly the same as the first one. And that was not in the case of Dairo. So yeah, when I actually met Dairo, we became really good friends. He's a super nice guy as well. And uh, well, he got really good. He, he gets along with Danik as well. So for some reason, we started to tour together. And well, for, so people call us like the Revealed House Mafia or something because we we're like the main faces of Revealed right now. And well, it's fun, you know, we're touring together. And uh, if it comes back to the to the management point, uh, music-wise, it's just Danik, Dairo, and me who are just. Shares music, who share music as friends, uh, ask about, uh, ask each other about uh, an honest opinion, what they think about the songs, and I think, yeah, I think that that's that, 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 that's how it should be. You know, we're just having fun, making music, and as the song is done and the pro product is done, then Seb comes in, and you know, even Justin with the marketing plan and everything, and. That's how actually it goes with Reveal. Well, it's interesting because that's when, when the whole team Hardwell kicks in. Uh, because, like you said, it then goes to uh, Seb. Uh, at what point does it go to Anna where she would say, yeah, I like this or, or I don't? Oh, uh, um, all the time. <laughs> but Anna, the start, yeah. yeah, all the time. But that's because Anna's almost, almost, she's always there, like literally. When I'm on the road, she's there as well. And when, I'm, when I start working on a song, she already, she's always, she already, she's hearing the progress. So, you know, it's not that I finish a, pro, a song and send it to Anna like in a final stage. She, she, she heard that song already like over a thousand times, and 
Yeah. It's great to see things grow, you know, to hear a song when you, f you hear a few beats and then in the end, yeah, it's, it's really good. That's actually how it goes, you know. Anna is more on the, yeah, really the management side and uh, if it comes to Revealed, it's, it's yeah, Sepp and me who are actually you're, yeah, responsible for the music and the releases. So it goes into Anna's hands and then at that point, do you handle all the business or then you hand it off to somebody else, Anna? No, I handle all the business, but we do it together. You know, we are, of course, Seb is more the uh, music assigned side, I'm more the business side, but we do a lot together. We discuss stuff together, and so he's more, he does more of the social media side, which is not really, it's my thing, but not like, it's more his thing. So, um, yeah, we have divided that, but we, we work on stuff together, yeah. So you're, you're a very humble person, uh, but before Hardwell, uh, you also had, you had a hugely, wildly successful career, uh, also in the music industry. Can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the things you did uh, before you met Robert? Um, well, way, way back, I, uh, I was general manager of the uh, Amsterdam Dance Event. Um, and I, uh, when, I got, when I started there, it was like a proper fair with stands. And I was like, okay, this is not really dance music. So we turned it into what it is now today. And I was running my booking agency, Anna Agency, at that time, and that's still there. Um, Anna Agency is his booking, is Hardwell's booking agency. It's the agency of Danik, Dairo, Nicky Romero, and some more artists. Um, but after like four years ago, I felt like I needed to, I wanted to grow myself. I wanted to do more than only running the bookings. And I was already doing some management stuff, but. I wasn't assigned to do it, and I, that, that kind of clashed. So I started Sorted, and uh, now I'm more, my day-to-day -day stuff is the management, and I'm still involved with Anna Agency. We're in the same building, in the same room, actually, so it works really well together, having the agents and the managers in one room. Um, yeah. Um, how did you get into it, Manny? How I got into tour into, management. Yeah, into the business and tour managing. Um, maybe like five and a half, like six years ago or so, uh, Eric Murillo reached out to me and he asked me one night when I walked out of the crazy horse here in Las Vegas if I wanted to be his new tour manager. And I had no idea what tour management meant. I mean, I managed some nightclubs and some bars and restaurants. And then he's like, you know what, I'll show you the ropes. And I, I was with him for about five years, five and a half years. And then last year, I, I, I retired working with Eric in, in October on a, Friday, on a Friday afternoon. And on Monday morning at 9.50 in the morning, Anna called me and said, would you like to work with Hardwell? And he wasn't the number one guy yet, but I know who he was. And I said, sure. And then like a month later, he became the number one guy, and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm pretty lucky right now. I <laughs> um, worked with Eric Murillo, a legend, and then now working with, with, with another legend. So I've, I've been very lucky. I'm bringing you with me to the blackjack table. I, I'm, actually, I'm, actually a good, I'm actually good luck sometimes. <laughs> How about you, Justin? I know you, you, you touched on it a little bit, uh, but what keeps your passion going? How do you mean? Uh, for this, the business and for the travel and... Uh, it, it's not always funny games, it uh, could be very stressful. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've always considered myself a very driven person. Um, I'm always striving to achieve a bit more, and every, you know, business opportunity for me is a path to something greater. Um, and, you know, this has been a situation where it's continued to grow. Um, you know, from the start, it was, it was experimental, um, it was trial, and now, it, you know, every day my, my position in the company gets a little bit more advanced. Um, but you know, like you touched on it before, it's a family situation and I feel like I'm a big part of the squad and I get to make decisions on, on the team's behalf which empowers me and makes me feel um, like you know, I'm doing a good job and you know, my, my work is worthy um, and that's kind of what keeps me going in the morning. It's not, um, it's not about a dollar amount, it's not about power, but it's about achieving goals and you know, seeing something from the beginning to an execution point is you know, the most fulfilling thing to me. It's not... Um, it's not anything more than, than achieving a goal that, that uh, you know, wakes me up in the morning. And 
I, I'm a very low key person. I try to stay, you know, under the radar. But uh, if you do a good job, success shows, and you can keep quiet, and that's what makes me happy. So that's kind of what keeps you passionate. So you know, a lot of people uh, here in the audience are, you know, within the industry, uh, maybe some up and coming emerging artists, producers. Now, Sebastian, as the label guy, what can you tell people uh, and potential artists, people that are uh, that want to be the next Hardwell? What what advice can you give them? Um, it's all about music. You have to focus on music. Like, don't spend too much money and time on your social media. Just focus on your production. And if the music is really good, then you will get noticed by label managers, labels, by DJs, producers. And so I see a lot of producers uh, working on uh, social media, marketing, and their music sucks. <laughs> so I'm more like, come on, just work lock yourself up like 24 7 for months after months after in the studio work on your mu music and when it's good you will get noticed you know you don't have to do anything about marketing just focus on the music and yeah that's really important has so. there ever been a time where you heard something that uh that you didn't like that you know as you said sucks and then all of a sudden you hear it like on a, in, a, in a club or you hear it in somebody else's set and you're like what what happened sorry <laughs> does, does that ever occur sorry Oh, if you, you, um, there's a record that you might have thought wasn't that good. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you find out somebody else signed it. And it becomes yeah. a hit. Yeah, but that's, you know, you, you make a lot of mistakes. Sometimes we get a lot, really big track or really track where I think it's not so good. But then Robert says, I think we should sign it. And then I'm like, I'm not feeling it. You know, like maybe it's because the track is too, there's a big kick in the track. I don't like that really much. But then he, you know, Robert is. Yeah, I tested the tracks and it works really well. And for me, it's really easy to refuse and deny demos. But I, I'm not in a club at the moment. And when Robert's testing new tracks, then he really knows that it works. So that's uh, a good trick as well. Yeah, I think on the other hand, I want to add something to that because I think I'm, got, I'm not going to name the records, but mm -hmm. me and Seb declined three of, I think, fair to say, the three of the biggest hits on, like, well, three of the biggest EDM hits nowadays in the in the last year. We declined them for reveal. And because we didn't, feel, we didn't feel the music at all. And we, we don't sign that much record on Revealed. You know, we have a lot of releases, but we're like really strict on what we sign. And over the last year, every single record we have released on Revealed has been in a Beat Portal 5 now. So, you know, as long as, as Seb said, you know, we're focusing on the music and not about how big a record can be. We're not, we're not aiming for like a big billboard chart position. We're aiming for the dance floor. And we're not aiming for the radio as, as well with Reveal. We're like a DJ label. We're aiming for... We, we, the only thing we want to do, if you look up, look up uh, the latest Revealed releases, the Revealed releases are always like played by 80% of the, the major DJs. And that's a good thing. And that's what we're aiming for. We're, we're focusing on DJ music and not about like making a big radio hit. You know, it's funny. If you talk to any young emerging DJs or even established guys, the one thing that they do say about you is that besides the fact that they say you're a nice guy when they've, they've met you, but they also say that you're a DJ that will play a record in your set and uh, that no one else has played and give the opportunity to some other guys. So that says a lot. Um, that says a lot for, for I think you. there's always a place for good music, you know? And uh, yeah, you come in, it starts the story over again. That's why we start Revealed, you know? I want to show the world what what I think and what Seps thinks and you know what we think with reveal what good music is and yeah and I, I don't know I, I I'm I have the opportunity to promote every record in my sets and that that's what I always do you know I always try to come up with uh, exclusive sets with exclusive music because you know I don't want to play like the same sets as all my other colleagues and yeah, well with, with with my own label I think that's a great you know, great way to exp uh, expose give exposure to the new music so um, I oversee a bunch of different music channels on Sirius XM. Uh, I also host a daily radio show on BPM uh, at 7 a.m. Eastern every day. And uh, I ask my listeners if uh, they had questions for the panel, and they gladly uh, sent them along. Since we're uncensored, I actually had to edit out the bad questions, the dirty questions, because I don't want to disrespect these guys. But um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Oh, Angela from Houston, Texas would like to know from Anna, uh, what else you'd be doing in this business if, uh, what else would you be doing if you weren't in this business? What else? Wow. 
Um, it's, I guess it's a hard question because it's all you've known in your, yeah, in your professional life. Yeah, and I love life. music. I remember when I was like a kid, when I was like five years old, from my pocket money, I used to buy singles, you know, and I always been, and I, when I was like 14 and I discovered clubs, that's where I was, you know, my mom couldn't stop me. <laughs> so what would I do? I don't know. Fire Maybe some, some charity. Yeah, fireman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jesse in Cleveland wants to ask Paul, uh, how did you get started in this business? You work with a lot of DJs, Hardwell, many others. How did you get started? Hey, uh, it's, a, it's a, a long story, but I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I, I started doing club promotions for a record, a record label called XL Recordings out of the UK back in the early 90s, and I was... When I moved over to America, I moved to Florida, and uh, handing out promos to DJs was a way to get into the clubs for free. So um, I'd call up DJ IC down in Orlando, and he'd put me on the guest list at the club, and I'd come down there, and I'd give him his 12-inch, and then um, I met Josh Wink that way. Josh, Josh always remembers when, when he met me at a club in Gainesville, and I gave him a Prodigy 12-inch. Um, and then from there, I... Uh, I, I moved to New York and um, I was working at a record label and I was working in a restaurant and a friend of mine was a, a DJ and he said, oh, my, my agent just stopped doing this, like, uh, would you like to take over my bookings? I was like, yeah, sure, I can probably do that. Um, I mean, it was, I was always, I loved the scene, loved the music, so, but I was at the, at the record label and so I was working three jobs at the time and um, this guy, DB, you know, gave me my first shot at being his agent and introduced me to a few other guys. And, you know, uh, DJ Dan was a huge, huge catalyst for AM Only. Like, without DJ Dan, AM Only wouldn't be, you know, where it is today. And then Carl Cox in, you know, th this was like 1996. <laughs> then I think in 1998, I signed Carl Cox. And it's just, it's, it's just been a dream. It's got to be a dream come true, especially... So funny, our stories are so similar. <laughs> I never realized that. <laughs> well, and, and now you've worked... In 2001, uh, Tiesto, and, you know, and, you know, we've been through Electronica, we've been through, you know, all these other uh, names that America likes to term electronic dance music. <laughs> I can't remember the other ones, but Electronica <laughs> was a big one for a while, and now EDM's the, uh, the current. And now uh, AM Only is the pinnacle of, of the game, so congratulations on, Thank you. on that. Thanks very much. Uh, Kelly in Jessup, Georgia, has a question for Hardwell. Uh, by the way, she says that electronic dance music is alive and well in southern Georgia. All right. Um, uh, Hardwell, what was the Rock Academy in the Netherlands? Was that a... Um, yeah, Rock Academy. Well, uh, when I finished my high school, I went to the Rock Academy. Uh, it, is, it's, it has nothing to do with rock, so I don't know where the, <laughs> the name rock came from. But. It's just a great name, even if it's not. It's Rock Academy. It sounds great, right? I yeah. think that's why. No, it's, it's, it's a music school. I've I only, I only been on that school for like one year. Um, why? Because actually my parents told me I had to study more. <laughs> so that's why I picked that school. But um, yeah, well, it was a good year, though. I met a lot of uh, other producers. We, uh, well, we, it, it's, it's a normal school, so you had like... Uh, uh, lessons in history of music, we did even vocal coaching, producing, but also like more the business side, managing side. So yeah, I learned actually a lot from them. But other, on the other hand, I was signed to the first uh, record label at the age of 14. And uh, I, st I, I started working there in a professional studio. And uh, besides that, I was always there with, with, with all the business meetings. And you know, I was always interested in the more management side and the business side as well. And, yeah, well, after 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 all that experience, I, I quit the school within within a year, and you know that that's, that's actually the point when I start, start, decided to uh, start revealed recordings. By the way, it just goes to show how your fans are these rabid fans that they would ask about the Rock Academy. Uh, that's pretty intense. It's that I think it it came from uh, from the documentary though. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> this question is for Justin from Mike in Brooklyn. Uh, what are some examples of really brilliant marketing plans in EDM that you've seen? Put me in the spot, Geronimo. Investing a lot of money in Facebook likes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. 
Uh, one of my close friends, J this is outside of Hartle, right? It's at just an EDM in general? Yeah, well, I guess they said, uh, yeah, it, within uh, electronic music. Okay. Uh, so one of my very close friends, Jake Udell, I got to give the guy credit, he's a very, very bright mind. Um, he had signed this artist called Zoo. And he told me when he first met with the guy, he asked him a question. I do this with all my, with all my new clients. And the question was, tell me what differentiates you from every other artist in music right now. Um, and that's how I'm going to build this story around you. And you know, he want, the, the artist Zoo wanted to be represented by music, not by a face, not by an image, but just by his music and his sound. Um, and that speared this beautiful marketing campaign, which, which made the artist faceless, um, which I thought at the time was brilliant. Uh, he'd created this outcast remix, and what they did is they, they blasted it out on the internet as, as an unfaced, unnamed song, and that built a bunch of buzz and recognition for that music. People thought it was a disclosure collaboration with Outkast. It was just about the time when you know, both of them were going to play at Coachella. Um, and just, just seeing the progression of that artist through this faceless type, I mean, to this day, I don't think there's one image where you can see what he looks like. It has a very cohesive branding, um, beautiful artistry. Everything is connected to like this, this um, um, you know, art in studios type machine that he's doing. And I thought the way that he presented that to the world and how he presented it to each of the bloggers that were interested in working on it. You know, he'd called up one, each one individually and said, you know, I have this beautiful concept I'm doing. It's this artist zoo. We're doing music that you haven't heard of before. Um, we're not going to put a name on it. I want to tell you it's this guy, but please, for your demographic, take the name off of it and you can be part of this story. And that got everyone really personally invested in his sound and really build a beautiful buzz for it that, um, you know, that, that, I, that I really became attracted to. And I, and I always say with marketing, you have to play consistency. And with him, it was a very consistent marketing platform. And to this day, I think he's one of the most buzzed about artists at the moment. So I have to give him credit for that. Well, I'm being told to wrap it up. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for sitting through this and uh, my, uh, my questions. And uh, Team Hardwell, you guys were really, really great. Uh, and really, congratulations. To, you know, there's so many big things happening. I don't know where to start, but the tour uh, is uh, for North America. What, what the official date is? Has it happened already, or, or it's what? the official uh, I Am Hardwell tour for well, North America? October 31. Okay. Yeah. So be on the lookout for that, as well as Madison Square Garden. And again, thank you very much, everybody, and thank uh, thank our great panel. Wow.